I, I've just got one more question for you now, which is, uh, what is your tagline for this episode to summarise your um, experience with Ruby's Yard and incredible education and all of the the, the community work that you've done? Well, it, it, the very hard, simplest, it would be get outside. <laughs> but that that sounds that sounds <laughs> that sounds rather simple. But I mean, yeah, get outside and breathe it all in. I guess, yeah, is 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 where, where I'm at. But I think that you know, getting outside and just really noticing the detail and mm. yeah take it all in hello and welcome to your tagline here with me simon tomlinson this is a podcast all about people and their stories. And each week we get the guests to come up with the tagline for the episode to summarise their story. In this episode, I speak to Kate Gordon, who has created a community interest company called Ruby's Yard, which is a community space in North Warwickshire where people can experience and enjoy nature. Kate explains how she converted an old boatyard on the Coventry Canal into a peaceful site for outdoor sports, recreation and learning, which is available for community organisations, youth clubs, schools, businesses and family groups. She also talks about another CIC company that she is a director of called Incredible Education, which provides nature-based services for local communities through horticulture and forest school activities. Before we get into the episode, I'd just like to mention our sponsor, KitLab, which is a digital marketing company based in Birmingham in the UK. KitLab have over 15 years experience and specialise in branding, websites, digital marketing, social media and more. So if you want to grow your business online, just head over to kitlab.com, which is K-I-K-L-A-B.com. Okay, without further ado, let's get started with the episode. If you do like it, then please make sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe so you don't miss out on any future content. Hello, Kate and Jake. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Jake. <laughs> Uh, hello Jake you're, looking you're a bit the gangster this morning isn't he very gangster <laughs> um the first baby that we've had on the podcast <laughs> uh so we're gonna we're gonna see how this we're gonna see how this goes uh but yeah thanks for coming on and I'm looking forward to speaking to you and finding out more about Ruby's Yard and incredible education um and I first met Kate I think it was about maybe four years ago um when so i i met kate through the speak up challenge because kate was a speaker and i was filming um and then we got together because kate asked me to film a video for ruby's yard which i did um and i came along and i was i was lucky enough to be able to see uh, ruby's yard in in full flow uh, with lots of people utilising it. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about first of all. Uh, so Kate, can you just um, explain to the viewers and the listeners what is Ruby's Yard? It's, it's an old boatyard um, along Coventry Canal um, in Atherston, which is North Warwickshire, uh, which is where I grew up. And uh, my nan also lived, and that's who she was called Ruby. And I'll tell you a little bit about her um, maybe a bit later on but so ultimately it, in its kind of rawest form it's an old boatyard that we're transforming into a green space um, for community use whether that's community groups or organizations um, yeah so so it's about providing a, a green space which has access to water and is in a very lovely park with lots of walks from it um, because actually the area of Atherston and the kind of deprivation levels shows that a lot of people might not have kind of access to experiences like that so yes it's a venue at the heart of it really um and and it came from your uh, grandmother ruby yeah um so can you tell us a bit more about ruby and, and who she was and why why you've dedicated this to her ruby i mean nana basically uh, dedicated her whole working life to supporting the development of young people so uh, through school and education but it, it kind of evolved into um, outdoor experiences and kind of team building. So, so moving people outside of the classroom environment, which works for some, but not necessarily everybody, and looking at how you help support the development of other skills that are very important in in generally being a human, I guess. You know, how you work as a team, <laughs> um, how you build your own self-confidence, um, how you problem solve, 
And so she was really passionate about, you know, providing opportunities, especially for children who perhaps don't come from, you know, privileged backgrounds where you have access to camping equipment. Um, so, so, so she was very keen on this. She had always had a thing about people spending time, um, even if it's just one night under the stars, away from, you know, I suppose technology wasn't a massive issue back then, but it certainly is now. And just really, I guess, connecting with each other in a, in a space that's, a bit unfamiliar and, pu- and pushing your own boundaries as well yeah yeah and it, and it is a, a beautiful space that you have which is right next to the canal and it's um yeah a, a lovely environment for people to go to and i think that um you're right that um some uh young people who um come from unprivileged backgrounds don't always have uh, the same um access to facilities um so providing that um Providing that environment for people, I think, is is an amazing thing to do. No, I was just going to say, and I suppose the other thing as well, just what we're from leading on from what you were saying there, and, and it does talk about kind of camping and outdoor activities, but also the canal. And um, the canal is a is a, a huge network across the country. It has a lot of heritage. You know, it's it's how the kind of you know industrial revolution and um, it, I guess how modern life started to um, form in transporting things all across the country and that sort of thing. So there's. There's a lot of heritage around the canal system. And my nan, who was a bit of a feminist of her time, wanted to be the captain of her own ship. And of course, that's quite a male role. It certainly was in her time. So she she really enjoyed learning about and driving boats as well. And that was her way of kind of a- achieving that dream. So, you know, long term, it would be fantastic to have, to be able to provide young people with the opportunity to to engage with the canal in, in whether that's water sports or, you know, through a narrow boat. Um, but now, I mean, Nana's no longer with us. She, she passed away in 2016. Um, but she'd started this kind of idea of this boatyard um, and it was just a seed of an idea, but her health deteriorated. So it's 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 me and mum and a couple of other directors who currently run the CI, CIC. Um, so, yeah, so Nana lived on Slacks Avenue, which is the road leading to Ruby's Yard um, and basically was the one that kind of pushed forward and said, I think we should try and do something with this. So we've just carried it on, if you like, as a legacy. Uh, so in, in your role, um, turning it from a piece of land into a place where people can can actually use it and you mentioned uh, a CIC which that stands for what does that stand for so a CIC is a community interest company it's effectively a not-for-profit organization so it it runs exactly like a private organization but ultimately the profits um, go back into the organization Um, so it's, it's it's kind of a I say it's a halfway house between a kind of charity and a business um, we chose the option of CI, and this is quite important, I think, when looking at your legal structures. And, and in hindsight, I think a CIO would have been a better option for us, which is a charitable incorporated organisation. Now, I'm not a legal expert, so I don't know the ins and outs of both of the options. But ultimately, there are some benefits about being a CIO. Um, that's closer to being a charity, but yet you can still run more like a business. So um, it means that you have access to more funding than being a CIC. Um, and it does mean that you don't have to register for things, you don't have to um, do corporation tax and things like that. So there are some benefits of being a CIO. CIO is a kind of more recent option, I guess, to segue between charity and private organisations. So the okay. two in the middle. And I think the one thing at the time, we, we got some legal advice and we kind of explained our vision. And I think, you know, that's where you always start, isn't it? And it has evolved over time. So I would think that now, based on the fact that we really do want to just access funding to keep topping up the site and making it a really fantastic facility. And the way that we're going to, the business model that we're going to follow in the future, we're probably more of a CIO than a CIC. So we're going to have to make that transition. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's worth looking, any organisation, look into it and, and really work out which which option is best for you, really. And how did you go about... Um, creating Ruby's Yard from the 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 just piece of land that it is what what were the steps that you went through I'm not gonna lie it's been quite tricky <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um I think in any when any piece of land it's really important to look at um I guess what facilities you already have on site so we have electricity and we have water so that's two big services that are ticked um however one we don't have one thing we don't have is flushing toilets um So we have, you know, had compost toilets and things like that. But ultimately, if we want people to be able to use the site for a weekend purpose and do water sports, which means wanting to have hot showers. So so there has been some complications. So I guess in terms of 
had it had it not been had it been land that we were choosing from scratch on our own back I, we probably would have looked at all of that but it was a piece of land that my nan had seen and so we had to go with what what was there really so that's been a real challenge partly because of all the I guess the red tape that comes with any sort of development of a, of a, of a piece of land and property and and I would say that in the team of directors that wasn't a particular skill set that any of us had okay. so there's quite a steep learning curve within the team that we had to try and yeah, understand that, you know, whether that's the Canella River Trust or the Environment Agency or the Planning Authority or the local authority. Mm. So that there's, um, and even the, the residents of Slacks Avenue, getting them on board and working okay. with contractors and understanding building regulations, all this kind of stuff just kind of emerges. So it's, I would say, if you were going to look at developing a piece of land, one thing that I would do retrospectively now would be to get somebody in the team who's who's come from that background and can really support the journey and understanding making sense of it so yeah it sounds like a lot of things to have to deal with especially and a, and a lot of stuff to have to learn especially dealing with local authorities dealing with local residents um uh, yeah i imagine that there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy that you have to go through and a lot of and to be honest i mean i've really enjoyed learning about it really enjoyed it because it has been really interesting but when you're learning in in such a slow pace it takes longer and actually, the benefit that we've had is our overheads are very low because it was land that my nan bought before she passed away. Okay. So we don't have rental charges. If you were trying to set that up and you had the overheads of a monthly or annual rental, then that's a huge impact on how how quickly you can move to make the site functional enough to generate income. Um, and that, you know, looking at the sustainability of a, of a business model, you know, that's what private sector does. Um, you know, anybody who's setting up a, a, a business will do that. So I think in the same principles apply when you're setting up a charitable, charitable um, incorporated organisation or a community interest company. It's how sustainable it is. Because yes, you can get funding, but it'd be great to be able to survive without always needing injections mm -hmm. of cash for your bread and butter, your overheads and things like that. Talking about money, where have you got the money to fund this? Um, is it something that you funded privately or have you done some kind of crowdfunding or got it from somewhere else? Uh, yeah, I'd say in the early days, it was definitely a bit of kind of digging into your own personal pockets just to kind of get things moving and um, just small kind of direct donations or loans here and there. Um, but but actually, once you register as a CIO or CIC, the doors open to accessing funding pots. Okay. Um, so my general belief in how you fund for a site is we've when when we need new assets or new facilities so new toilet block new wash a new slipway new steps to the back gate you know new landscaping new fencing when there's a kind of capital injection that's needed i would go for a funding pot but ultimately the long term game is to be able to generate enough activity in terms of renting the site that then means that you're able to cover all your overheads um and keeping your overheads like electricity water you mm -hmm. know all that sort of stuff to a minimum um, which is part of the carbon footprint piece anyway as well. So, okay. yeah, I mean, our overheads are about, at the moment, about £3,000 a year, and that includes insurance. Okay. So based on the activity, if we were generating, you know, X amount of events per week or whatever, that would then mean that we'd be able to, to do that. And we can still rent the site at an affordable rate of about £12 per hour. So we want to make okay. it like, like a village hall because it's about being an affordable space in a community that doesn't have access, you know, debt deprived area of North, North Warwickshire. So, so people can hire the whole space for £12 an hour? Yeah, so the, I mean, we've just upgraded all of the facilities, which means the overheads will go up. So we've okay. now got flushing toilets and showers, okay. um, you know, and there's, there's electrical points across the site, there's paths now, you know, there's, there's a lot more stuff that will need to be maintained now we've really improved the site. And therefore, we may well increase that slightly. But the view is that if we can generate income from, say, private hire, so it might be like um, you know, a group of people did want to hire it for a camping event that are just a private private party, if you like, or something like that, then they might have a slightly higher rate because that will help them keep the low the cost low for youth groups and okay. uh, other sort of community groups that you know don't have as much money available because they're fundraising all the time yeah so uh, i mean it, it sounds like it's fantastic value for money because i i have been to the site it was a couple of years ago that i was last there so when i was there last there wasn't flushing toilets or showers um so it's and and, and the pathways and stuff and the electrical points so it sounds like you've done a, a lot of work uh, but it is a fantastic piece of space how just to give people an idea of how big it is i would guess it's probably maybe two football pitches? Yeah, something like that. Probably in, in its totality, that includes the car parking area. Yeah. And, 
and that so yeah and I think the one thing that's lovely about the site is that yes you've got the boundary of the site but it immediately goes out onto the North Arden Heritage Trail which is uh, mm. you know, quite a well known area for walking and there's a lovely bit of um, common land uh, alongside the golf course lots of woods and old ancient trees and then there's also a big recreational park so it's almost like you've got your little environment that you hire but actually the space to go and explore is is much far beyond you're not surrounded by roads if you like okay um, but so just to go back to your question about um, fundraising so so in terms of that capital injection, we've had a number of really, of, of really significant parts. So we've had Sports England, who gave us about one hundred and forty thousand um, wow. pounds to to do the, uh, the the wash block and the running water and doing the whole landscaping piece, so making the whole area very camping friendly and putting up a boundary so that kids don't wander into the cut in the middle of the night if they're okay. in a tent, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, and we've had another pot from Canoe Foundation to upgrade the slipway, so it means we can be able to launch vessels. And we've also had another pot recently from Green Shoots, which is a local authority fund, to um, plant some hedgerow to support wildlife across the site and create natural boundaries and zones, if you like, um, and also put some solar lighting along the path so it's safe at night time as well. So that's all kind of going in now. Um, obviously, we've been impacted a little bit by the whole COVID situation. <laughs> yeah. So activity has been a little bit light this year um, okay. in terms of events. Um, but we're, we're, we're finding our feet again, like everybody is, I guess. Yeah. So just talking about events now, if there are people watching or listening and they're interested in using the space for something, uh, whether it's a youth group or a a team building event for their uh, company or whatever it might be, or just a group of uh, mates who want to use it to camp for a weekend um how can how can they find out more about uh actually using it and how can they get in touch yeah so we have got a website which is on the on the on the edge of just being updated we're just getting some better photos of all the new facilities so so there is a website which is um, rubysyard.org and um, so if you just go to that website you can find uh, there's a contact form on there and that that actual form goes directly to me and um, so i'm kind of on the receiving end of general inquiries that come in um, so that's the best way to do it. I guess the one thing to say is at the moment the site is open as a seasonal site and that was part of our planning conditions that it would be open from sort of March to October. Okay. So we're just coming up to kind of the, the closing. Um, but, you know, I think in terms of maintenance and looking after the site, you know, if the people are interested in volunteering, still now's the time to talk. Because okay. I think the, the, the overall view of Ruby's Yard is a bit like if you build it, they will come. We've done a certain amount of legwork to get the site running in a certain way. And we've made some good relationships with the likes of Warwickshire Young Care. But ultimately, this is a site for the community and we want it to be shaped by the community. So ideas and inspiration from people who are out there is is you know that that's going to fuel its future basically yeah so yeah with with ruby's yard it, it sounds like you've done an amazing amount of work to get it from where it was to where it is now uh what are your plans now for the upcoming years um have you got any specific plans in place or ambitions that you want to achieve overall the resource issue is just continues to be a bit of a challenge so all of us are volunteers i'm normally full-time uh, working for another organization so um i actually live in manchester so i i support the project remotely my i've got a friend called polly who's down in london she's another director she's a great project manager and has helped with the website development she's down in london then we've got my mom and jack um who've both got backgrounds in in lots of areas of public services and things like that and youth development and um, so we're all volunteers uh, Mum's retired. Jack's still in work. So it's it's that the biggest challenge for us is having enough resource to to keep the ideas growing and developing. So I think that's the one thing we need to focus on, and and really developing a, a really solid team of volunteers who who take ownership of the site and and feel like it is theirs to look after as well, and and benefit from that through having connections with each other. I used to work for the men UK Men's Shed Association, which was all about kind of bringing primarily men together to create community workshops and they would have all sorts of projects and they collectively run the 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 shed and I think if we could try and find a, a team of volunteers of you know a diverse team not just men and women you know or from all different types of backgrounds if we could develop a team to help maintain the site and help grow the site and take ownership of the site that's that's where I think our energy needs to be um, we have considered looking for funding for a project manager role so that they can take on a two to three day a week. But of course, we need to find funding for that and really hammer out the specifics of what that means. Um, 
yeah, so so I think that that's kind of where the, the, the directors are at. This year has been focused on getting the site upgraded and facilities. So during this quieter period, we're going to start brainstorming that a bit more and start looking to what other partners we want to work with. Warwickshire Young Care at Carers absolutely love the site and have used it several times again this year, um, you know, abiding by all the restrictions um, and they can see real value in it. So, yeah, we, we're optimistic about the future, about how it will grow. And we just think that people will start now they can see how it works properly with toilets and there's no limitations on things like that. I think, yeah, inquiries will, will, will start to grow even further. Yeah, great. Well, if if there's anyone watching or listening who uh, lives near Atherston or in the, uh, is it North Warwickshire that Atherston is, um, then um, yeah, get in touch and, and volunteer your services to help out because it's, uh, it's a fantastic um, site and, and does amazing things to help, to help people in, in yeah, the Yeah, and of course, area. if you want to go, if you ever walk along the Coventry Canal, you can walk past um, the site. It's got a, a big banner up, so it's pretty obvious where it is. It's between the Hatting Factory um and sort of uh heart so yeah if you walk along that stretch <laughs> cool okay so now i want to talk about another project and another organization that you're involved with which is called incredible education um and i know that you're a a director within that organization is that right yes <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah no i am i am and it, it's, one of, it's one of those journeys where i went down because i thought i'd quite like to pull up a few carrots and help out with a, few, okay. a, a bit of a bit of growing veg and i ended up somehow becoming the director <laughs> along the way. <laughs> uh, so tell us more about it what is incredible education so they they they've recently moved to a new site but ultimately they they provided um they started from a kind of horticultural uh, providing horticultural courses so um, supporting people's understanding of how to grow things. Um, and they they were based on an allotment site. Um, and then there was a guy called Ian who kind of established that as the, as the, the initial business, I guess, just because of his own passion for growing fruit and veg and, and all the rest of it. Anyway, they his wife was in education and had started taking an interest in forest school. So she started setting doing forest school activities and they started to realise they needed a bigger site. So they've recently moved from, this is in Manchester in Salford, they've moved from an allotment down to what's called Cleveley Community Forest Garden. Um, and uh, it's a great site. I mean, it was it was a, an abandoned, um, I guess, nursery, if you like, for, for plants and things many years ago. And it's just become all overgrown. And they have, in the last year, um, have developed a really excellent team of volunteers who have completely, obviously with the support of Ian and Judith, who are both directors and the original founders, have completely transformed. I mean, it's incredible what they've done. And it just shows if you get that solid team of volunteers in place, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's amazing what can be achieved. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I've had a look through the website and it does look like a, a, a great organisation that does lots of uh, lots of different things to, to help the, the local community. And there's definitely a, a common theme with the things that you get involved in, Kate, which is um, stuff to do with nature, stuff to do with community um, and also stuff to do with education and like also with the stuff uh, with the things that you did before with men's sheds that that also had a a, a similar theme to it as well um so yeah that, that's uh, definitely something that you're you're interested in and and passionate about um so in your role as director for incredible education what is it that you that you really do yeah, they, so they invited me to be a director because um, I think when you're, especially a husband and wife team, um, as two directors, you can become quite, I mean, you can become quite focused, on, in, in inward focused, if you like. So you can only see what you know. And I think they wanted some new brains from different perspectives to kind of come along and um, and sort of show, you know, what other opportunities there might be. And, and but I think... The, the one thing they're quite keen for me specifically to focus on as a director is to look at how we develop, um, a bit like Ruby's Yard in some way, they've got the forest school stuff well established, um, they've got the horticultural stuff that was well established as well, but actually what they wanted to do is see how the site, which was originally a kind of access to all um, you know, allotment site and, um, and nursery, how can they turn it back into something that feels like there's some sort of community ownership? So one of the things that I've been supporting is developing a friends of group, um, which so outside of the volunteers who do the site maintenance and help with all the kind of practical on the site stuff. What can we do to develop a team of volunteers that go out and promote the site um, and, and help support little events? So we did a summer teddy bears picnic event 
Uh, we've got a pumpkin carving event lined up in a few weeks' time. We've got a Christmas decorating event, a Christmas tree decorating event, little conifers. And that's about bring, inviting people to come down and basically do a little activity for free from some of the areas, the most deprived areas of Salford, to come down and actually engage with the site. So that it's not just this exclusive site that you can only get access to if you're doing forest school or if you're doing horticultural course. You actually have access to it and can, can be part of the experience of Cleveland Community Forest Garden because it is a beautiful space. Mm. Um, so yeah, just, just helping, I guess, develop sort of additional arms to the organisation um is is where my role is is sort of sitting at the moment um and and one thing they're really keen for me to help with as well um working with a guy called gary who's actually called from incredible Ed edibles um and that was all about growing um uh, yeah making making use of um available green space for growing things in communities so you know where you see redundant green space in mm. a residential area how can you make the most of that so he's got a lot of experience in supporting similar organisations and we're looking at how we help the sustainability of the organisation long term um, because Ian and Judith eventually will want to re retire so how do you do that succession planning now so when they go the whole thing doesn't fall apart so we're, we're looking at that so it's kind of strategic stuff really which is yeah it's stuff that I'm interested in because it's um problem solving isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it sounds like it, it sounds like a, a great project to, to be involved in it I imagine that it um a lot of the things that you've learned from doing Ruby's yard probably comes in in handy as well with that um you've mentioned a couple of times a forest school um can you can you just briefly explain what forest school is and how that can help teach children or educate children in a slightly different way to the traditional uh, school classroom setting yeah I, I believe it comes comes from the, the 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 whole thing of forest schools comes from Scandinavian countries I think I think Denmark is a, a big pioneer in it but it it goes back to I guess what my nana believed in which was not all children le learn in the same way and a classroom mm. environment isn't actually particularly supportive for a lot of children in, in in how they develop and how they learn and how they build confidence in their own abilities you agree, do you? Um, <laughs> sorry. Jake agrees, yeah. <laughs> um, and so the idea of forest schools is about taking children away from the classroom environment and throwing them into, I guess, what would more of a natural habitat mm. and using practical learning experiences in a, in a kind of, uh, yeah, a natural setting um, to really support the development and, I guess, throw them into, yeah, experiences that they might not always have access to because again a lot of people who go to woods and experience tree climbing and, and, and doing stuff with their parents is because they have access to a car and their parents can drive mm. them to lovely places you know so it's about providing alternative education that takes kids back to kind of nature um, and learning practical skills in a completely different environment so that you're you're painting a bit of a bigger picture on how children learn and, and nourishing that um, I think, you know, fair to say it only exists in nursery and primary school at the moment. Okay. So that's fantastic. And that's a great movement towards recognising that. Um, but yeah, questions about that sticky bit of teenagehood. Um, <laughs> it's still very much that old fashioned way, isn't it? Of, of... Yeah. I mean, the school system is like been the same for many generations now. And uh, I don't know. Well, for for some children i'm i'm sure it's great and it's fine uh but some children it's some children definitely find it hard and i think having alternative schooling systems out there and i think doing it in in nature is is a great way to learn because that's on our natural habitat really at the end of the yeah. day isn't well it? it has a climbing effect just by being in hmm. in nature so i guess the the ability to 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 focus um and actually really engage with what the teacher is trying to teach you is probably heightened by that yeah. Um, but yeah it's it, it is a really interesting I mean I was I, again this morning I just thought I'd watch you know Sir Ken Robinson's um who sadly has passed away now but his um his YouTube or his TED talk about whether or not schools kill creativity I have a lot of friends who are in the teaching trade and you know they are incredible people so passionate but mm. I think they are stifled by the system that that is, yeah, like you say, very old fashioned. Um, you know, we, I think in Sir Ken Robinson's um, talk, he talks about the fact that a child born today will be retiring in 2070, say, and we don't even know what the next five years look like. And we're still trying to sh push children into a kind of shoehorn of taking information and regurgitate it out on a, on a piece of paper. Yeah. And that assesses your ability. And, yeah. 
you know, I, I get it because it's how else you kind of do that. But, you know, creativity, compassion and kind of uh, curiosity are the things that maybe artificial intelligence won't be able to replace. And, excuse me. <laughs> Is that very disruptive, Simon? Is it? No, no, no. It's, it's fine. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's very interesting points that you make, and I think also a, a big challenge that we obviously have at the moment is climate change, um, and I think in the modern society in, in which we live, we kind of we forget about the the natural environment that's out there and that can uh, make us behave in a in a certain way because we kind of forget that the natural world exists whereas if we if we do go to school in that environment then we're probably more likely to treat it with respect and and act in a more responsible way uh, to to help keep the planet going for future generations absolutely it's like a full circle isn't it you know the industrial revolution meant that we all came down from the hills if you like yeah. and went into factories and stuff and that was part of the human progression of you know the next step and next step but in that process our relationship and understanding of the importance of the natural environment to sustain our own existence has been lost mm. so there's a complete um disconnect between understanding how our own survival is utterly you know completely and utterly linked with the natural world um, so if we can create spaces and, you know, marry up our education system with those spaces and really nurture that again, we'll, we'll develop a generation mm. of kids that will be much better at kind of making decisions about how we do things. Um, <laughs> definitely in agreement. <laughs> um, and an another point as well that I'd like to make is about technology because our world is filled with technology and it's like, well, I mean, now we're recording this over <laughs> uh, video conferencing, which is, which is useful to have. Uh, but I feel like the younger generation may become over dependent on that technology. So having facilities where people can just get away from it and, um, and, yeah, just just have a, a break from technology. I think is is a really useful thing as well. Yeah, and I, th I think you, I think you're absolutely right. I think this idea of um, a bit like a working day, uh, not allowing it to stray into a kind of constant feed of engaging with technology, uh, but also changing our relationship with technology. I think there's a lot of blame on oh, you know, Facebook has been designed. We know with certain things that are addictive and blah blah blah. But ulti ultimately, if we can try and support people's understanding that it's there to serve us and how we interact with it is our choice. I know it's it's not mm. that simple, um, but also but maybe making po technology saying you know if you use it well, actually technology and nature can be merged. Taking photos, getting really close and personal with the beauty of a you know a flower or a leaf or something like that, and then taking photos is is using technology. So it's not saying it's bad. Put it away. Mm. It's saying use it in a way that's supportive of learning rather than mm. it being just something to distract us. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a really good point. And um, I, I do really enjoy spending time in nature and taking photos. And actually that encourages me to get out there because I feel like I've got an activity that I can do in nature. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's a, a really nice thing to do. Um, so uh, I, I've just got one more question for you now, which is, uh, what is your tagline for this episode to summarise your um, experience with Ruby's Yard and Incredible Education and all of the the, the community work that you've done? Well, it, it, the very hard, simplest it would be get outside, <laughs> but that that sounds that sounds <laughs> that sounds rather simple. But I mean, no, I think it's great. It's simple is good. Why why overcomplicate things? I think get outside is a fantastic message to give people. Yeah, get outside and breathe it all in. I guess, yeah, is 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 where, where I'm at. Yeah, just really, really, as we know, Simon, that whole mindfulness of, uh, and and the word mindfulness has been overused so much now. It's a little bit icky. Hmm. Um, if, if that's what happens for me. But I think that you know, getting outside and just really noticing the detail. Hmm. Um, yeah, take it all in. Yeah, and I think that's that's a great message to have, especially. Uh, well, luckily we're out of lockdown now so we can spend more time outside um but actually getting out and, and spending time in nature and f for me i i live in a city center so even when i go outside it's not really being in nature so i do try to uh, go out to local parks and uh, local wildlife uh, because it's it's very calming and, and very good for uh very good for us mentally um and emotionally 
Mm, yeah yeah and especially you know the change of seasons is always a really lovely time mm. and it's is literally changing by the day at the moment um and you know, it's effectively going into sleep mode and 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 and, and there's some beautiful colors out there so yeah really just going outside taking it all in um and that's where it starts that's where the, the passion for being outside starts Awesome. Thanks, Kate. Uh, thanks for coming on. And um, yeah, uh, it was nice to, to see Jake and, and let him have um, his say every now and again. Uh, his first, first airtime podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thanks very much for coming on. Yeah, great. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed the episode with Kate. We'll see you with another episode next week. And to make sure you don't miss out on all future content, just make sure you subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.